Greetings from Brussels, from NATO. And it's an honor for NATO and for me personally to join your distinguished audience today. And I thank the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, our partner organization, for organizing this important and very timely discussion. The theme of this discussion is important. It's important for Bulgaria as a member of both the EU and NATO, but also for all your Atlantic institutions, be it EU or NATO, also for allies and for partners in the Western Balkans and beyond. We are at a difficult juncture for global security and stability. Russia's barbaric attack on Ukraine is a threat to peace and security everywhere. And it also threatens the very basis of the rules-based international order. It also threatens the essence of our societies, of every individual, every person, our businesses, NGOs, our institutions. Why? Because Russia is attempting to deny Ukraine the right to make its own decisions. The choice for Ukrainians to decide what they want their country to be and what future to have. And this freedom of choice, this sovereignty, the right of people, be it Ukrainians, Bulgarians, Icelanders, or anyone else, the right of people to live in freedom and decide the future of their country is a fundament and fundamental right of our societies and the wider international order. If we deny this right to one and accept somebody else's right to control it, then we accept it for ourselves. That is why NATO and the EU are responding together with many other countries to support Ukraine's self-defense and their right to make their own decisions. We respond together to protect fundamental principles that have guaranteed peace and security for NATO allies, for EU members, but also for our wider partnership for the last decades. That is also why each one of us, every one of us in our societies at individual or group level have to do maximum to support Ukraine and thus to support the peace and security in our countries and globally. We at NATO do believe that peace and stability in the single Euro-Atlantic space can best be guaranteed by NATO and the EU working together. And Western Balkans is definitely part of the single space of freedom. NATO offered Western Balkans countries partnership and integration prior to the EU, also as a consequence of our engagement and operational intervention in the region in 1990s. Today, most of the countries of the Western Balkans sit at the North Atlantic Council table here in Brussels as full members and take part in allied decision-making. They chose their way. They chose to be part of the alliance and they participate in the decision-making as free people and as sovereign countries. We think that that is one of the longest lasting investments that NATO has made in the region and also that has proven in time to yield the best results. We see that the whole Western Balkans region has made huge progress in the last decades, economical, social, political, uh, stability and security wise. And despite acknowledging backlogs and recurrent problems like in, in many other regions, we are firmly convinced and committed to make sure that achievements reached so far become irreversible. And that is important that in order to fully achieve this, we fully support the region's integration into the European Union to the highest degree possible. Again, it will be up to the people and the countries to define and decide the forms of integration in the EU. But as far as the overall interest for the peace and stability is concerned, we at NATO support this integration process. Uh, looking at NATO, when we discuss the particular role of NATO in the current situation and the wider international situation, let us remember that earlier this month, on the 4th of April, we celebrated the NATO Day. What is that? That is the day when NATO was founded, 73 years ago. Allies came together to establish NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, guaranteeing 
peace and security for their peoples, their countries, their territories, and their future. And today, it is one billion people and 30 allied countries who are members. Russia's brutal war has highlighted the importance and brought back the main core task of NATO, the collective defense and deterrence, and its role. Uh, the importance of being united by a strong transatlantic link is visible every day as we speak. We quickly activated our defense plans within hours of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. We deployed thousands more troops to the eastern flank of the alliance from both sides of the Atlantic, meaning also from the US, to demonstrate, but also to ensure that those countries that are members of NATO, that each one of them is safe and secure. And the commitment that we have given each other is iron, strong, and fully, fully supported by actions. Along with that, of course, it has also, this current situation brought back this to the center stage, the importance that NATO attaches to our partnerships and to each and every one of our partners, to their security, stability, and territorial integrity. That is why allies, partners are supplying Ukraine uh, with maximum aid possible, be it lethal aid, non-lethal aid, humanitarian, political, financial, and others. But that is why also we provide training exercises and other uh, capacity building to other partners from Georgia to Western Balkans. Never ever NATO has worked so closely with EU partners, with partners across the globe, with the private sector, with academia, non-governmental organizations, as we do now with one primal objective, to defend our shared values, our shared understanding of what it means to live in a free country, to be free as individual, as society, to live in democracy, and to have that highest respect for the rule of law in our countries, in our partner countries and everywhere. That is our joint and common interest, and we believe that the best to achieve, indeed, is by working together. Having said that, we have to remain vigilant, of course, that there are other threats out there, uh, that a kinetic attack, such as Russian attack against Ukraine, comes with a variety or is enabled by a variety of other non-conventional threats. And uh, we should never lower our guards on these threats. We might not have kinetic attacks to our societies, to our countries, uh, no. But we have to be aware that non-conventional threats, especially we are referring to the Western Balkans or other countries such as hybrid uh, challenges, foreign interference, take place on an everyday basis. Foreign interference has become, in more recent times, particularly insidious, and that is indeed for a number of reasons. First, it is very often difficult to assign an ownership to foreign interference. It can be international, it can be transnational, but it can also be domestically enabled. Also, new technologies have enabled, in many cases, even facilitated hostile actors to interfere in a wide variety of ways in our societies. This makes it more difficult for all of us, for NATO, for allies, for European partners, to detect and respond to these threats. So uh, in that respect, uh, we, have, we have clearly identified that foreign interference can take many different forms. It could be hostile information activities, including disinformation, and uh, indeed, the main aim very often of these activities is to sow discord in our societies. And that doesn't require soldiers being deployed on the ground. Uh, it can be conducted from outside of our territories, such as also cyber activities. Uh, and, and they have a potential to cause significant degree of harm and destabilization. Uh, there are no geographical constraints and they are below uh, the threshold of an armed attack very often. Then, of course, uh, in such a situation, the countering of all these threats is one of top 
priorities for all of us, be it within the EU, be it within NATO, be it among the partners and others. Um, the way we proceed, whether these activities manifest themselves through disinformation, cyber threats, or through, through other use of hybrid tools such as energy and security, uh, we are particularly vigilant in first monitoring all these phenomena uh, to identify where they take place in our countries, in Western Balkans or elsewhere. And we have provided uh, a lot of inputs to our partners and allies in the Western Balkans because of the unique importance that NATO attaches to this region. So not only we know and we monitor what is happening, but we share that information and we also share the experience and our knowledge how best to counter it. I would also like to say a few words on, on a particular importance for Western Balkans uh, that is here in the Alliance, the way we feel it, and, and allies are very unanimous about it. I would say that the Western Balkans region has marked, uh, and again I noted that earlier, impressive progress in the last decade. So the level of stabilization that has been reached uh, since the 1990 is very significant, both from political, institutional and security dimension. Um, indeed, NATO will continue to promote stability, security and cooperation in the region through the cooperation with our allies from the region, with our partners, and through our mission uh, in Kosovo, the K4 mission, but also through efforts of our offices in Sarajevo, NATO HQ Sarajevo, and in Belgrade military liaison office there, but also through our everyday cooperation with the European Union, uh, with the United Nations and the other members uh, of the international community, other international organizations and, and their colleagues. For that reason, for NATO, uh, we regard it as imperative to counter all attempts to undermine and destabilize any Western Balkan country. Whether it's an ally, whether it's a partner, we cannot face these threats alone. We need collective action. And this is what makes cooperation between NATO and the EU and the wider international community essential. We do that with one very concrete purpose, to protect our freedom, your freedom, and our common world. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Baiba Braj, thank you very much. <clears throat>